you got a couple of days to kind of check out the tape of Saturday's game. Just quick, what more did you kind of you know, take away from that? Well, obviously, you know, from the offensive point, you know, very, very productive. You know, some of the came away wanting more drives, wanting a little more strain. But how, how can you complain at the end of the day? Our guys went and made a ton of plays. Um, just a lot of things to clean up from effort finish to pad level to communication. You know, up front, I thought it was really solid, but I think we're capable of more, right? So you take a critical look at every deal. Uh, defensively, I mean, we, we shot ourselves in the foot and played some bad ball at times. You know, that's communicating, it's execution, it's being on the same page, it's jumping off sides on third and eight. Um, it's not getting your eyes right and doing your job in certain capacities. So uh, in the special teams game, I thought it ended up being a little bit of a wash and really proud of Dean kind of stepping in there. And uh, we always need to make that um, an advantage on our part. And we kind of missed on a couple things. I thought the opening kickoff, if we take care of a double team, really has a shot to go to the house. So we know where we are right now. I mean, that, that is who our team is. That is who our players are. I thought Portland State played extremely hard, and you know we took a critical eye and we evaluated all that stuff this morning. We'll adjust those roles, and our learns got to get out there, right? Because the biggest thing we talk about is being a mature competitor, and a mature competitor looks at things that he does wrong, doesn't like it, and finds ways to grow and get better. So that's what this football team needs to do. Defensively, how many of those problems are – fixable and how do they kind of translate 100 percent are fixable stack? i mean 100 percent are fixable I, like i said their scheme keeps you on their heels i didn't feel like we were attacking i think you know from my point of view as a coach like we gotta we gotta have more things to cut our guys loose you know i think the option kind of hesitated what we wanted to do the unbalanced stuff uh, obviously the running quarterback there's a lot of different things that that they do so gonna see a completely different style this week and one we're more familiar with and we got to go out there and and play uh cougar defense uh, the strengths of Texas Tech, obviously, they also kind of had a higher scoring offense in their last game. What are your plans to combat that, especially from post game? You were talking a lot about the defense, how you have to get back in on Monday and working on that. Well, the most part about the defense, we got the right men in the room. They want to get better. They saw things this morning they didn't like. They know they're correctable, and um, that's that's where we want to be, right? So. Obviously, they're high-powered. I, I believe at the end of the season, 12 games from now, Texas Tech's offense will be top 10 in the country. I think since they went to this quarterback last year, um, it just kind of clicked. They're rolling. He's confident. They got a bunch of receivers around there. I think they upgraded at the offensive line, and the tailback's going to be the best all-time rusher in Texas Tech football history. And I don't know their history per se, but I would imagine that's pretty good. So they're dynamic. They're explosive. Um, obviously, Coach Arbuckle trained under their offensive coordinator. So, you know, they have our playbook. We have their playbook, right? Who's going to execute and who's going to play harder and go out there and, and win a big time football game in a great environment. So the challenges are high, but we feel, you know, confident that we can go out there and play our game too. A big time game, obviously bringing in a Big 12 opponent. That's something that's going to be important, just getting like nationwide looks and one of those few opportunities that you guys are going to able to kind of bring in a bigger team. What are your thoughts on that and kind of the importance of showing what you got? Yeah, I, we don't really talk about that. It's a faceless opponent, and it's a, and our, op, our second opportunity of the season to prove who we want to be as a football team. I mean, that's going to be our focus. Uh, we talk about it all the time. We train in the dark, so in those moments in the spotlight, we're conditioned to do what we're trained to do, period. Right? It's when people think it's a big-time environment and I need to do something outside the core of what you've been trained to do, that's when you get in trouble. So the better team will win. The better team that executes in the fourth quarter will win. This is going to be a hell of a ball game, uh, just like every game will this season. So excited to see our team get better. That's what I want to see as the, as, as the head coach here and you know, excited about the challenge that this week provides. Last one, only because I know someone's going to ask you. But uh, you're talking about their top receivers. Obviously, you know one of them pretty well, Josh Kelly. Yeah. Um, just maybe talking about, you know, he had a pretty good game, his first game, uh, what it's going to be like having him back on the Palouse, and just a little bit more on that. Well, I think, you know, I don't, I don't talk much about that. It's one of those things where in new college football, you're going to play, you know, former players. Right? That's, that's kind of what we've been dealing with the last couple of years. Uh, I think hopefully Josh would take nothing but positives from his experience here. Um, he did a lot for our football team and our program, and you know he's he's tough to defend in the slot, and he's he's good in their offense. Wayshon, uh, with his uh, had a receiving and rushing touchdown, first uh, to do that in a while. Did they let you know who the last to to do that was for Washington State? 
No, I'm not sure. Uh, it was Max Borgie. I don't remember who it was. Or last freshman to do it in his debut. I don't remember who that was against. Oh, it's going to be against Wyoming, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. <laughs> Just had to bring I, that up. I distinctly remember that day. I, Coach Leach came out and ran the ball, like, the first four plays. And we're like, what the heck is going on? And, uh, you know, they, they got us there. Um, dude, how much did you guys use the helmet communication on offense and defense on uh, Saturday? You know, so every play on offense uh, with John, and I thought we did a good job executing that, and it was super clean, no no real issues there between him and Coach Arbuckle. Then defensively, um, between Tyson Durant and, and Boogie. So uh, kind of that quarterback position of the defense. There was one play, I think it was before the fourth down conversion, where it looked like Coach Arbuckle was giving hand signals. Was that uh, just kind of something different than the, the actual play? Remember, it shuts off at 15 seconds, right? So... Sometimes we'll do a look at me and check the signal so John knows and can anticipate, you know, that he's not waiting for something in his ear that's not coming. So we've repped all these things. Um, and so you still got to have a little bit of blend of both. And tech is the same way. I mean, you can see those guys signaling at times, too. I just want to ask about the pass rush a little bit. Only the one sack coming from Khalil, yeah. but it seemed like there was some some constant pressure, and obviously uh, Portland State's quarterback's pretty mobile. What did you kind of see when you saw the tape on, on what it was like getting to the pass, or was it good enough, or you need more? Well, I think that? it's one of those things, just alluding to the performance in general, it's never as good as you think it is, right? It's never as bad as you think it is. I think schematically we asked those guys – you know, to eliminate gaps. And, and like that's what I mean about not dictating because we were so worried about the option and different things. We didn't cut those guys probably loose enough. You know, we'll be able to do that this week uh, through just different game planning and different schemes. And, you know, Eddie had the big one. You know, it was almost like a throw forward by whiplash. I don't know if it was an actual throw, but that's what it kind of looked like a little bit when you reviewed it. Um, so we had some hits, um, but we got to be more disruptive and, and our game plan needs to kind of let those guys at times go hunt. Uh, you know, Tech's coming off a game. They went to overtime, went down to the wire. Uh, not maybe specific to this opponent, but in your experience coaching, what is it like when a team is coming off a game like that where they really had to fight tooth and nail all the way to the end? What do you expect from that? Well, it reminds me of 2022 Idaho. I mean, that went down on the last play. How do we follow that up? Went and won a big ball game on the road. Um, I think as Coach Bull used to say, like Lou Holtz would say this, like you bring a new team to the field every week. Right. So I don't know the mentality Texas Tech took into that game. I knew ACU on offense were poised. Or, I mean, and they executed a great plan. Right. So just like us, I mean, you take a hard look at it. And I'm sure those players are, are going to come out defensively and ready to you know, show that they're better than that, which absolutely they are. And offensively, I'm sure they're feeling really good about their performance. So. Um, it went into overtime. Their starters had to play 80 plus reps. I mean, we had no one on our team played more than 55. So they got to come here to our house at our place um, to a packed stadium and loud. I mean, there's a lot of advantages on our side that we got to make sure that we're doing we're doing everything in our power to take advantage of. It, it feels like the comparison might be a bit lazy but you think back to last year's game against Wisconsin similar and you know home game huge crowd the environment just how excited are you to get out there on Saturday and and coach in this game yeah I said it last year at the time when we ran out the tunnel against Wisconsin I've never heard Gisa feel like that in my time never you're right and that's two years of, of running out the tunnel it's got to be like that you know the zoo crew our students they got to come early they got to pack this place it's got to be loud I mean, hell, we got a band violation on Saturday. I've never heard of that in my life. Okay, I asked them about Florida State, and they play like the, the chop the whole game. Or I played Tennessee State once. It's, the band never stops playing, right? You know what I mean? The whole time. So I was like, what are we, what are we talking about? So they gave him a timeout instead of delay a game. And when it, when it was fourth and four at the four-yard line. So I don't know. I like that they pushed the envelope. I'm not mad at the band. I like that. So... Um, but it's got to be loud. Uh, that Wisconsin environment was incredible. Um, that's what we're capable of doing. And that's the choice that we need to make as Cougs. So this week, you know, is a, is a huge chance for WSU to recognize the late leg the le legacy of the late Mike Leach with yeah. two of the programs that he impacted the most. Uh, when you walk these halls, do you, have the, I just had a, do you have the same office as Coach Leach? And when you walk the halls and sit in that office, what kind of what comes to mind and how does it feel to kind of be in the shoes of, of a legend? Yeah. It's the same 
it's the same office, but I think he had more character in it, right? I think the pirates' hats and the the signs and the uh, kind of pirate mannequin, I, I believe. And so, yeah, I mean, it was cool because I got the you know kind of the leech honoring helmet last year. Actually, Durham Harris made that. That caused the big stir. Um, really super cool. Um, so, I mean, that that'll be up on that shelf hopefully for a long, long time. And that's the imprint that I believe Coach Leach has left on Washington State. I've said it. Okay, it's a crime that there's not a statue of Mike Price around our stadium, and Mike Leach would be right there, in my opinion. And I don't know enough about, you know, things, but that would be on a high priority in my list for Cougar football to get those two things taken care of because I give Coach Leach, once again, credit for making Washington State football relevant and believe. And to do those two things against all odds, against resources, against, you know, what recent history was at that moment, I mean, that's not easy to do. So, and he did it his own way. You know, and I've heard every Leach story from, like I shared last year, um, to him being tough. And that, that is what was needed at that moment in time in Washington State. So uh, to put him in the Hall of Fame, I think is a big deal. And then kind of converting to the football questions, how much from this past weekend, um, the, the strengths of your offense, how much do you believe that's, that's transferable for the rest of the schedule? Well, I think it needs to be. You know, we're not going to win this football game 10-7. to 7. You know, these guys got to go out there. And the best part I love is that Carlos is still not involved in that mix because Carlos is 1-8 to Kyle Williams 1. And that's what's exciting for me. And to see Chris go make big-time plays and Trey make plays and, and Wayshon and, and Javinsky. And, you know, so it was exciting. It was a great first step. But just like anything else, we need to be humble. We need to be able to handle success. We need to have a certain level of expectation that this is the standard. We need to perform that way and with that type of energy and feeding off each other. That, that's what I kind of loved about, you know, our, our game on Saturday. And, and, heck, I will say one thing about even on defense, when you score that fast and you're out there for 90 plays, I mean, it's, it's a lot. You're trying to make a couple adjustments and we're back up. So um, it's exciting just to kind of roll through those things. Coach, when you look at the tape from Saturday of Texas Tech, um, I know you're not going to give anything away, but what do you think Abilene Christian did on offense that really kind of messed them up defensively? Or, or what were some of the takeaways you saw on tape? Well, I think they had a quarterback that was playing on time and on rhythm. I thought they protected him really well. They took care of the ball. And, you know, sometimes you get nine months to prepare for – well, that was the first time Texas Tech saw that offense. ACU changed it from a year ago. Uh, so, you know, I think that coordinator came from Valdosta where he had a ton of success. So they put a great game plan together. And, you know, you can't just say, oh, let's just do what ACU did, right? Because they're making those corrections right now and they'll be ready for that. So, um, but I, I meant it. They stayed really poised. They got down early and just kept scratching and clawing and fighting and then had the ball with a chance to win, right? So, protected what good teams do. They found a way to win a game. So let's not act like they lost this game. They're going to learn from this. They're going to have extreme confidence. And this is a really good football team coming into the Palouse. And then for your own team, it seemed like uh, on a few plays down the field, um, your corners had great coverage for five, six seconds, and then the ball was just kind of yeah. thrown up and they were able to come down with it. What's kind of the, the coaching or teaching method on that to just try and like finish out a play when it's so late? One of them he threw off his back deal as he's falling down. I, there's not much coaching there. That, that worked out. I think he was throwing it away, and it didn't quite get all the way out of bounds, and the guy catches it. Um, you know, the other one was kind of off a jump off sides, and I think we got a little lazy and lackadaisical. Um, and then the guy went out and then made a play. And I think it's great learning moments because Texas Tech is going to make plays. Okay, this, this number eight, dynamic. Okay, the slot guy, dynamic. Like, they are dynamic at really every skill position. The tight end, 6'9". Like, they're going to make plays. So the fact that that happened, I'm good with that. Right? I want to see Ethan O'Connor bounce back from that, which he did. I want to see Steve bounce back from that, which he did. So, you know, like I said, a little adversity in the game is great. Is, is great, and we learn from that. So, uh, But we got to attack the ball because this quarterback is one of the best back shoulder fade throwers I've probably seen in a long time. You know, so they're really in sync with the receivers, and you know, I think that creates a lot of momentum for their football team. 
Um, obviously, you were talking um, the last time you got the chance to talk about uh, Lili, about how he would kind of, you know, brighten your spirit just even seeing him out on the practice field. I'm wondering what you kind of saw from him on the sideline, uh, even not being able to play, uh, kind of cheering on and coaching up the offensive line last week. What I love about captains and leaders is that they come in all different ways. Okay, Lili doesn't say anything until it's time to say the right things. And then guess what? Everybody listens, right? Because they're like, man, this guy doesn't say anything. This must be really important. And he just works his tail off. Uh, he wears that cougar on his chest with pride. Uh, so to just have him out there and represent our team as a captain is important. He's got a huge week of practice this week. Can't wait to see him out there. He gets to now go in some one-on-ones. He gets to do half of the team periods. So, it, you know, just can't wait to see him continue to grow and develop back into – what everyone knows is one of the best left tackles in all the country. And uh, what did you kind of see? He right tackle. He plays right <laughs> tackle. <laughs> what does it mean to you seeing the unit even out there without him uh, last Saturday performing the way that they did? And what are you kind of expecting from them this week as well? Well, I would say this. That was Christian Hillborn's best performance since I've been here. And Christian's put in a lot of work um, to see him do it at right tackle. You can see now that He's repped it all fall camp. When he had to go out there some in the past, it's like just go out there and handle it. But now he's there. He's ready. He, he was the first one. Go watch Kyle Williams' uh, catch and run touchdown. Christian Hillborn was the first one to congratulate Kyle Williams in the end zone. That's how fast he ran from the line of scrimmage. We showed it to the team, one of the coolest plays I've seen in a long time. Were you mic'd up for uh, part of the game on Saturday? I was mic'd up. They, they have me doing all kinds of crazy things, you know, and I – you know, Bill, I mean, he's just he's a coach. You just go do it. So I, I go do it. Uh, I wanted to ask about Jamori's injury. I haven't noticed him wearing like a... Mike Dub's dangerous, too, now. I say some wild things. Yeah, but they wouldn't right. do anything <laughs> bad on the video. <laughs> it's out there, yes. Uh, with Jamori's injury, I haven't noticed him wearing like a boot or a cast or anything. Like, what is his injury and how did that happen? Now, we're not going to kind of disclose there. Jamori's just going to be out for a little while and, and we'll let you know when he's going to be back. And is there any update on Nick and how he's doing? You know, we're going to try to push Nick this week, and I think he'll be a game-time decision, you know. So we'll kind of see where, where you know, it's a kind of responsive thing. Uh, so he was, in, you know, lifting with the team this morning. So hopefully we can we'll be positive in that. This towards the end because it's not related to this game, but with the NFL starting uh, this next week, how important is it for you to be able to point to Cougs on NFL rosters as like a motivational tool for these guys or a, a way that they can realize their ultimate dream while still playing here? I thought you were going to ask me. Yes, the Packers are going to win the championship this year. Like if you like, if 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 you're a betting, I don't know betting, but like the Packers, they got it. All right, that's the team. Young defense. I mean, they're rolling. So um, it's awesome. You know, to have 12 guys, um, you know, that are in the NFL, you know, I get, you know, got a really cool text from a couple of our guys that, that made it. You know, I've talked to, you know, Hicks and Shaw and, and Brennan. And to live out a dream, you know, I, I say it, you can go wherever you want to go from right here at Washington State. And those are homegrown, developed guys. Um, you know, sometimes, in, you know, today's world is going to be interesting. Like when, I don't know, when Cam gets drafted next year, like he's still Washington State grad. Right, we still develop through our program, you know. So there's a lot of positive things in in that regard that you can point to and say, "Hey, I can live out all my dreams right here from Pullman, Washington." Uh, and just any changes to the two deep this week, or same as what it was last week with 83 oars? Yeah, same last week. You know, excited unless Bill did something I didn't realize, but uh, you know, we're the same same kind of outfit, and we're we're expecting all those guys to be ready to go. I think it was on Wayshawn's touchdown run. Um, as he kind of gets to the second level, Devin's out there with him, and Devin meets a linebacker, and uh, it's a collision, and Devin ends up kind of falling down a little bit. You know, it's one of those plays that maybe doesn't look the prettiest on tape, but how much do you kind of feel like the offensive line realizes it's more about the effectiveness? Because obviously it slows down the backer and frees Wayshawn rather than, you know, hey, it's a pancake, but it still does the same job. Yeah, Devin's just one of – like if you picture like an old lineman, like – Devin Clean's face should be right there. It's just, it's dirty, it's it grimy, like he's holding half the time. Don't tell the refs, but like, you know what I mean? When you get in that combat, like it's just, he's in there and he just makes it happen. You know, once again, the coolest thing ever, we had one of the coaches describe Devin in fall camp and just said, like, this dude would die for this team on that field, right? And that's how much this means to him. He has waited his turn, he has earned his opportunity. I don't know if there's anyone that had more fun on Saturday than Devin Kalani. 
because he was out there just a you know, big sweaty dude but like just out there just having fun playing ball and realizing a dream and representing something that means so much to him Uh, so Tech and Wazoo, their O-line, kind of talking about the O-line, the O-line um, kind of legacy is kind of connected a lot largely because of Coach Leach and Coach McGuire and Coach Castor. How much, how much, how important is it to, for you to return to that kind of legacy of, of recruiting you know, top-notch O-line men, and how important has Coach Castor been to that, that transition? Well, I think, you know, first off, when I got the job, I hired Clay because he understood what it took to do that here, and we really shared a vision of how we recruit offensive linemen. Right, we talked a lot in the last, you know, two years about developing that position, and it's really hard to do. So, uh, big, long guys that can eat their way into 300 pounds, but they're great athletes, but they're physical and they're tough, and they just got that old school blue collar chip on their shoulder. So, yeah, Caster, you know, was a was an old lineman, right? So, you know, he kind of carries that on and shares our vision. They're both very different teachers, but it's such an important position and. You know, to the modern day air raid, those guys got to do more than just pass protect. All right, Coach Leach's guys are just big guys or athletes that could just pass pro. Now they're pulling and moving and zone scheming. So we ask them to do a lot more. And, you know, I think our guys are, are been up for the challenge. And I'm excited for that group to take the next step. I think you saw what they're capable of on Saturday. Um, but we need to keep getting better and take that next step, which I know they will. All right, go Cougs. Thanks.